Now let's talk about the spark that led to World War I. And I, I want to emphasize that this is really just the spark, that you can't really say that World War I was caused by what we're seeing in this video. We already talked about the aligned system. We already talked about the militarization of most of Europe, especially Germany and Great Britain. A lot of these folks were, frankly, very much primed for war, and some would argue even desired war, for a whole set of reasons, imperial reasons, to keep their opponents in check. And to some degree, or to a large degree, what we're talking about was really just just what allowed all of these actors to act on what they had been mobilizing for. So there's a little bit of background right over here, and we've already seen it before. This is the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and you see it's a com combination of a bunch of ethnicities. And in 1908, in 1908, it formally, it formally annexes Bosnia and Herzegovina. So let me write that down. That this is an important point. So 1908, you have Austria. Austria uh, or Austro Austria Hungary annexes annexes Bosnia Herzegovina Bosnia Herz Herz Bosnia and Herzegovina I'll just write it like that for now now we've already talked about the ethnic connections between the the various people who speak Serbo Croatian especially between Serbians so you already had with the kind of the the fall or the the steady dissolution of the Ottoman Empire you have a Serbian Republic form right over here they have the same language and religion and consider themselves the same people as a significant fraction of of the folks living in Bosnia and Herzegovina. About a third of the population in this country are Serbian and Eastern Orthodox. And then, of course, the rest of uh, the dominant religion here, or not the dominant, I would say the close to half of the people were, or, were Bosniaks or Muslims. You also had a significant Croatian population, but all of them had the same linguistic tie. So you can imagine there was a lot of desire to unify this and frankly a lot of anger at Austria-Hungary for kind of splitting them apart and taking over uh, or kind of ruling over the people who were so close to them, had ethnic and religious ties. And so the Serbian government at the time, uh, there were elements in it that were did not like this, that were trying to uh, trying to get elements, especially Serbians in Bosnia and Herzegovina, to essentially rise up to allow them to liberate themselves from Austria-Hungary. And one of them in particular was Gavrilo Princip. Gavrilo Princip. And this is a quote from him well, later on after he had been arrested, and we'll see why he got arrested in a second. And he says, I am a Yugoslav nationalist, aiming for the unification of all U Yugoslavs. And I do not care what form of state, but it must be free from Austria. So up to this point, even though you had these linguistic and ethnic connections, and obviously you have some religious differences, but this linguistic connection amongst the people, these southern Slavic states, it had not been unified before. And when he's talking about Yugoslav, the, a Yugoslav nationalist, he's talking about the southern Slavic states. He wants to form them into one nation. And so on June 28th, and this is one of those super famous dates in history, on June 20, let me just say this is in 19, so all of what I'm going to describe now all happens in 1914. And to some degree, the rapidity which it, with, it, which, with which it happens kind of speaks to the fact of how primed Europe was for war. So 1914, June 28th, you have the Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie visit Sarajevo. So this is Sarajevo right here in Bosnia, right about right about there on this map as well. And Archduke Franz Ferdinand, he's the nephew of, of Franz Joseph, the current, I guess you could call him the emperor or, or the ruler of Austria-Hungary. And he is the heir to the throne. He is the heir. He is the heir to the throne. So you can imagine Gavrilo Princip and his co-conspirators were eager to do something here, and in particular, they, they planned to assassinate Archduke Franz Ferdinand. And actually, the, the details, and I'll maybe make a future video on it, the details of the assassination are fascinating. They essentially failed. They botched the assassination, Gavrilo and his co-conspirators. And then later in the day, Gavrilo Princip was just hanging out. He had essentially given up. He was eating a sandwich at a cafe. And because of a mistake made by, those, by the folks planning 
Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife's route, Gavrilo Princip saw his car coming, and then when they realized they had made the mistake in the route, they started backing up, the engine stalled, and then Gavrilo Princip essentially just walked, put his sandwich down, walked up to, to the car, and shot Franz Ferdinand and his wife and, and assassinated them. So this is essentially what most people point to as the spark that triggered World War I. And the reason why that is, is that immediately, already the Austro-Hungarian Empire, they were, they were kind of peeved at all of this unrest that the Serbians were causing, the Serbian nationalists to try to break up, but to try to separate the southern Slavic states from Austria-Hungary. Now they've killed the heir to the throne, and so you essentially have an ultimatum given by Austria to Serbia to say, look, unless you completely renounce all of this and have 100% guilt, we, you know, we, we, we're, gonna, we're going to take some action. And actually, Serbia was not keen. Serbia was not keen to get into a war with a major power in Europe. And so that for the most part, they were like, oh, well, you know, we're going to look into this and, and all the rest. They didn't, they did they weren't really kind of, uh, uh, kind of beating the drum beats. But Austria-Hungary was eager to kind of say, hey, look, we can, we can, we can deal with these characters right over here. And so Austria-Hungary did not find how Serbia, uh, Serbia's uh, acceptance of guilt acceptable. And so in July 28th, or July 28th, so let me write this. This is assassination, assassination of Franz Ferdinand, Franz Ferdinand, and his wife Sophia, and or Sophie, and Sophie. So on July twenty eighth, Austria, Austria Hungary, the Austro Hungarian Empire is not happy with uh, uh, essentially Serbia's apology or acceptance of guilt or whatever you want to call it, and so they declare war on Serbia declare war on Serbia. And up to this point, they're like, okay, look, we Serbia is a relatively small state. They are very closely aligned with the Russian Empire, but the the Austrians at this point said, well, you know, the, the Russians aren't going to try to get into war with us over this. We have, you know, a, a reason to disagree with what's going on. They exercised bad judgment there because the Russians were very closely aligned were very closely aligned with the Serbians. They obviously had a lot of roots. They wanted to maintain their influence in the region. And so you start to have a mobilization of Russian troops. So Russia begins to mobilize. Mobilize. So Russia, Russia mobilizes to help defend to help defend Serbia. And this was actually a very fairly slow process. But now we have to go back to the alliances that we talked about about several videos ago. You have to remember the Dual Alliance Treaty of 1879, Germany and Austria-Hungary to protect each other if Russia attacks, and actually even if Russia mobilizes. And this is kind of a legal, this is kind of a legal justification for why now Germany would say, oh, I have to go protect our my ally, Austria-Hungary. But you have to remember, Germany had been militarizing for the last several decades. It had been building a navy that could kind of hold its own against the British. It was to some degree eager for war. And so and so very quickly and the, the rapidity at which this has happened shows how eager Germany was for war at this point. So literally, literally three days later, August August the first, Germany declares war on Russia. Germany declares war on Russia. And now we have to go back to the alliances. We have the Franco-Russian military convention that says military assistance both ways in the event of an attack. Now Germany is aware of this. And so Germany says, look, why do we have to wait for France to fully mobilize? Let's also, because France is going to try to try to get into a war and we're right in the middle between the two. So Germany, two days later on August 3rd, August 3rd, declares, so Germany declares war, war on France. Now, at this point, Germany does not really want to get into a war with the British Empire. The British Empire has a very powerful navy. It's kind of the, the other extremely strong power. But Germany is kind of aware of this, of the treaty, this, this Treaty of London in 1839, this 75-year-old treaty. And it, it, it actually has contact with the British and says, look, 
as we go, if we attack France, we're probably going to go through Belgium. That's the, the, the fastest and easiest route through France. You know, you, you don't really take this, this, this treaty of London, the 75-year-old treaty, seriously, this fact that you're going to have to protect Belgium. And the British, who you could argue also had a very strong military footing, um, said, no, we, we do take that thing very seriously. So Germany it very quickly moves into Belgium in order to attack France, and that gave that gave the British Empire, gave the British the legal justification to then declare war on Germany. So let's see, August 4th, August 4th, Germany, Germany invades. So the Germans were quick to action. I mean, between the declaration of war on Serbia on July 28th, we're talking about six days later, Germany has invaded Belgium. So they were ready for this. Germany invades Belgium, and then this gives the justification for the British to declare war on Germany. So this leads to the British declaring war, war on Germany. And essentially, World War I was now well underway.